kids, we got something really exciting for you to watch today. It's gonna be great, you need to watch today. Today, we are gonna watch a creation science Bible lesson by Dr. Matt Whiteside. Boys and girls, I'm so excited to see you all today. This is another segment of Creation Science with Dr. Matthew Whiteside. I'm really glad I'm here with you, and today I want to talk about God the Creator. You see, in Genesis 1-1, we learn something very important. It says, in the beginning, the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That means that we have a God that created everything that we know about in existence, the entire universe, and he created it for you, and he created it for me, to be both stewards of, but also to enjoy. I don't know about you, but when I drive home and see a beautiful sunset over the Smoky Mountains, I think that is God's creation. And he created that for me and for you. But you see, in the beginning of Genesis, we learn about something about the nature of God. Everything he creates is good. And in the beginning, everything he created for Adam and Eve was not corrupted. And it was very good. He calls everything very good. But you see, it's not something that God did against Adam and Eve, the reason that things are not so good anymore. It's something that Adam and Eve did against God. You see, when they ate that fruit in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't the eating of the fruit necessarily that was the sin. It was the disobedience that they had against God the Creator. And there are consequences for that sin. You see, that sin led to death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That was the original sin. And from then, we've lived in a world that has been corrupted with death and chaos and disease and destruction. Those things aren't very good. See, disobedience to God leads to things that aren't very good. But the sin didn't start there, you see. People kept sinning and sinning and sinning and things start getting worse and worse and worse. And before you know it, God looked out over his creation, everything that he made that was very good, and people disobeyed him so much that he said, is there not one person that will obey me? He said, I'm going to wipe out this world in an entire flood. If there's just one person, though, that will obey me, they'll be saved. See, disobedience to God leads to death and decay and destruction and disease, but obedience to God leads to salvation. You see, there was one man that wanted to obey God, and his name was Noah. And Noah built an ark, and on that ark was Noah, his three sons, and their wives. Eight people were on that ark, along with some animals, two of many kinds and a few others of flying things and other birds and things of the like. But you see... Is that ark still floating out in the world today, or did it land? That's right, it landed, and it's on dry ground somewhere, probably near the Middle East. But you see, when we talk about that, we talk about a global flood, and we talk about all this water, sometimes some scientists over the years have thought, well, maybe there wasn't a global flood. They'll say, maybe there's not enough proof for that, and they would try to argue against things that are said in the Bible. You see, science has a problem, and its problem is, is that it's slowly catching up to what the Bible has simply always said. Because even though some scientists used to say that, for years, despite the overwhelming evidence against it, just recently, a new manuscript came out, a new, a new paper published a few years ago, and it says in the headline, Early Earth was covered in a global ocean and had no mountains. Isn't that crazy to believe that a scientist, someone that's so smart and so well educated and so well known can say one thing and believe it, yet when science shows a different thing and the evidence supports something else, they'll shift their thought process and follow where the facts lie. But it's also amazing to point out 
that science is just slowly catching up to what the Bible always, always said. Because in Genesis chapter 20, sorry, chapter 7 and verse 20, it says that 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. The Bible has said that for thousands of years and science is just now saying early earth was covered in a global ocean and had no mountains. It's amazing to think about, right? Well, you might look at a rock and say to yourself, then that rock seems really old, but let's do an experiment together. Here, I have some beakers. And in my beakers are many kinds of dirt. So if you would like, you can go out to your yard. I think your parents will give you permission. You might want to ask them first and get some little pebbles and get some slightly heavier soil and then get some light soil. And if you can, get some grass seeds too and throw them in a beaker. Once they're in your beaker, grab some water. Pour the water into the beaker. This will mimic the earth before the flood and if you have a little poker that your dad barbecues barbecue sticks with, you can stick it in with your skewer and start to mix. Once you mix all this up, you'll realize something very amazing. You see all those strata layers, layers that we find in nature didn't happen over millions of years. It turns out the strata layers you can make happen in just minutes. And that's exactly the way they happened. There was a ton of water that covered the earth in a global flood and only eight people were saved from that flood and a bunch of animals. And you can do this experiment yourself at home. It's fun, it's exciting, and it's neat to do because you can prove to yourself that even though something may look a little old, it's actually quite young. From these results, we see these strata layers. And this little spark, small experiment can tell us something. For instance, it mimics this flood. And to see the results of some such flood will tell us something very particular about God. You see, God sent a rainbow after the flood, and he told us he will never destroy the earth again with a global flood. Never again. And that's something fun to think about because even though we are troubled and that we have sinned, we also have salvation, just like Noah did on that ark. And our salvation can only be found by putting our trust in the obedience of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So all those sins that we have in our life, all the times that we've accidentally or sometimes on purpose disobeyed our parents, much like all the people in Noah's time disobeyed God. That sin can be forgiven if you just call out to Jesus Christ and ask him to do something with your sin that you can't do on your own, and that is wipe it clean to make you pure as snow. That's the way of salvation. Wait, what's all that noise? What's all that noise? Are Max and Aaron in the lab again? I better go check on them. Till next time, see you later. Bye. Welcome to Sunday School. We're going to start out this morning with a missionary story. and We're going to learn about a man named Samuel Marsden. Samuel Marsden was going to go to a place called New Zealand. How many of you know where New Zealand is? Where is it? What country, what continent is it near? Australia. Yes. Australia. is. New Zealand is near Australia. Now, this happened a long, long, long time ago, before New Zealand was settled. It was back when there were just native people in New Zealand. And these native people had quite a reputation, you're going to find out. All missionary Samuel Marsden wanted to do was to get to New Zealand, but he could not find a ship or a crew that was willing to take him there. He did not know that just months before, a ship named the Boy had anchored in the harbor of Wangoro on the shores of New Zealand, only to be boarded by savages who dragged the 67 crew members from the ship and killed them all. They were cannibals. Ships with crew members suffering with scurvy would often anchor in the harbors in plain sight of the land, but the men would suffer on board as their teeth fell out and their health failed rather than to venture to the land and encounter the cannibalistic Maoris, the native people of New Zealand. The fear of the Maoris was not without just cause. They were a 
people deeply immersed in the beliefs of magic, witchcraft, sorcery, and something they called the evil eye. The land had developed a reputation. Beginning in 1642, the slaughter and cannibalization of anyone who dared to set foot on the island began to be known worldwide when the Dutch navigator Tasman anchored there and was killed with a boatload of his crewmen. In the near years to follow, many more men were killed along the shores of this savage land. Now here was Samuel Marsden. He had come from England to Parramatta, Australia. But now he couldn't get to New Zealand because nobody wanted to sail a ship there. To overcome this difficulty, he bought his own ship called the Active and set sail with a crew consisting of Christians and savages. He took with them a few horses, some cattle, sheep, and chickens. And on December 19, 1814, the brave missionary Samuel Marsden landed at the Bay of Islands, close to the scene of the horrific slaughter of Boyd's crew. He boarded the skiff that would take him to shore and proclaimed, It's high time to make known the glad tidings of these, in these dark regions of sin and spiritual bondage. As the missionary stepped ashore, a terrifying scene greeted him there. There on the hillside just above the beach was a band of warriors armed with clubs and spears. Necklaces of human teeth dangled around their necks. Strings of gold coins they had plundered from their previous European visitors hung from their wrists and ankles. The savages stood in menacing stares and glared at the missionary. Suddenly their leader began to scream, Hero may I! Hero may I! That means, come here! Come here! The writhing natives began to advance toward the missionary and his men. Their faces were wild and distorted. They swung their clubs and thrust their spears in unison, approaching closer and closer. Can you imagine that? They were probably really scary looking. These warriors put no value on life. They would engage in war over the slightest thing. Sometimes they even went to war without even having a reason. They would kill and devour men, women, and children. They menacingly approached the missionary and his men. Suddenly, the ravaging warriors halted and stared with their mouths open. On the raft that had landed behind the missionary's skiff were two animals like none they had ever seen. What animals do you think that was that they were so shocked to see? Chicken? No, it wasn't the chickens. Horse. They could not comprehend what the huge creatures were that these white men had brought with them. Wasting no time, Marsden grabbed the reins and swung atop the back of one of these animals and began to ride it up and down the beach. What was it? A tiger? It was the horses. They were so shocked to see horses. They had never seen horses before. The natives gasped and exclaimed in fright and amazement. The missionary chuckled to himself. Never in his life did he think that his life would be saved by something as simple as riding a horse. That's the end for now. Next week you'll find out something else. We have a new verse today. Our verse is 2 Timothy 1 7. Anybody know this verse? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We got some good motions for this, this one. Here we go. Ready? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Ready? Try it again. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Very good. Who remembers our verse from last week? in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. That's good. Let's go over some of our ABC verses. Ready? A. All things are made by him. B. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. E. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. D, depart from evil and do good. T, early will I seek thee. F, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. G, 
God is love. H. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Here's I. Ready? I. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And J. Ready? J. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We'll go over those again later. So when you learn these verses, you're learning a verse for every letter of the alphabet. Let's try some songs. Let's sing it. Ready? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Bible. Good. The Bible will never fail. Never fail. Never fail. The Bible will never fail. No, no, no. I have a wonderful treasure, the gift of God without measure, and so we travel together. My Bible and I get the new look from the old book, get the new look from the Bible, get the new look from the old book, get the new look from God's Word, the inward look. The outward look, the upward look from the old, old book. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's word. Good singing. We're going to talk about a special word today. We always have a word every week in Sunday school that we learn. And this is a word you may not know the meaning of. In fact, it starts with a letter that's not a very common letter in the alphabet. Z. Yes, you're right. It starts with the letter Z or the letter Z. And who knows what the word is? Rebecca. Zealous. Zealous. Very good. Who knows what zealous means? Another word for zeal we could say is enthusiasm. It's something passionately, eagerly and passionate pursuit. Kind. When you're excited and you're zealous about something, you want to go do it. You're so happy. You're so excited. You're determined to get it done. We're going to learn about some different people in the Bible in the next several weeks. These people had a very special and a very important job. And there were lots of these people in the Bible. Um, these people were given a message. They had a message from God to give to somebody. Who can think of what this type of people I'm talking about that are in the Bible? Samuel was one of them. Jeremiah was one of them. Hosea was one of them. Jonah was one of them. What are those guys called? Think about it. Jenna. Prophet? Good, a prophet. We're going to talk about prophets today, and we're going to talk about a certain one. Do you know the Bible, there's books that are called the major prophets, and some are called the minor prophets? Do you think the major prophets were more important than the minor prophets? No. It's just that the books that they wrote were a whole lot longer than the minor prophets. So the major prophets were Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. That's the major prophets. Now you say, what about Lamentations? Well, Lamentations wasn't anybody's name. That was just a book that Jeremiah wrote. So the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Then you have the minor prophets were Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They were all called minor prophets because the books of the Bible they wrote were really, really short. But we're going to talk about somebody that wasn't any of those guys, but he was a prophet. Um, after King Solomon died, do you remember how we had King Saul, we had King David, and then King Solomon? After King Solomon died, the kingdom split. Jeroboam took ten tribes. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, only had one tribe. He had Judah. The northern kingdom was called Israel, and that's who Jeroboam was the king of. The southern kingdom was called Judah, and that's who I already told you, Rehoboam was, was the king. Now, terribly and sad, most of the kings of Israel, of the ten tribes, were not good kings. They did not love God. They did not obey God. In fact, they worshipped idols. Sometimes they even worshipped Baal. Baal was a false god. Um, god would have to do all kinds of things to try to get them to come back to him. Sometimes he would send other countries to attack them, to, to even take some of them into captivity. Some of the prophets were, speak, were preaching to the northern kingdom, some were preaching to the southern kingdom, some were preaching to the people when they were in captivity, some were called by God to give a message even to a different country. Well, today we're going to learn about a prophet named Elijah. Elijah was sent to tell a king of Israel named King Ahab. If 
you know anything about King Ahab, he was a very, very wicked king. He was one of the worst kings that Israel had. And Elijah's message to Ahab was, Ahab, there is going to be three and a half years of drought. Drought means there was going to be no rain for three and a half years. Now somebody think in your brain, what will happen to you land if there's no rain? Jenna? Well, we'll get all dried up and plants won't grow. You're right. And if plants don't grow, what kind of special plants that people need to grow won't grow? Stephen? Is there going to be like a, almost a famine? Yes, a famine. So there's going to be a shortage of food. There's going to be a shortage of water. They're, not, they're just going to run out of stuff because of no, no rain. Now, Elijah said, Ahab, it's because of you. You've been disobeying God. You've been worshiping Baal. And not only that, your wicked wife, Jezebel, she has been so wicked too, and you guys have caused all this trouble. Now, Jezebel was so angry. She said, I'm, that's it. I'm going to find all the prophets, and I'm going to have them hunted down, all the good guys that love God, and I'm going to have them killed. The Lord sent Elijah to hide. He protected him. He said, you go over there by the brook Cherith, and you stay there. And guess who he had bring food to Elijah? Do you think it was um, McDonald's or Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes, one of those guys? Who brought food to Elijah, Jenna? Sparrows? You're close. A Crow. different type of bird. What was it, Stevie? Robin? You're very close. I was going to say it starts with an R, but it's not a robin. Ravens. Ravens. The ravens would bring food to Elijah. Every twice a day, they would bring him food, bread and meat. Isn't that interesting? Can you imagine if God told you, hey, tomorrow, look out in your backyard, some birds are going to be bringing your supper. Would you say, wow, you'd be shocked, wouldn't you? But that's what happened to Elijah. You know what? The brook dried up. The brook is like a little stream of water. It dried up. And so God sent him to a widow, and a poor widow fed Elijah. You know that story? She had just a little bit of flour, just a little bit of oil. She'd make something for them to eat. Guess what? A little bit of flour, the next day was still, there was still some in her barrel. There was still oil. Every single day she went back, and God made sure there was just enough for her for that day. Because she was feeding Elijah. She was helping him. Finally, after three and a half years of drought, God said to Elijah, go to King Ahab. So he did. Elijah went to King Ahab, and Ahab said, is that you, Elijah? You're the one that's caused all this trouble. You've been troubling the whole country of Israel. And Elijah said, it's not me troubling Israel. It's you and your father's house, all your wickedness. And it's time to show people the power of the true God. It's time to show them who is the real God. Is it Baal, this idol that you've been worshiping and praying to? Or is it the true and living God of Israel? Elijah told King Ahab there needs to be a contest. There needs to be a contest to prove who the true God is. Prophets of Baal come, and you get a sacrifice ready to give to your God. And Elijah will come and give a sacrifice to, to, the, to the Lord God of Israel. And he said, we'll see whichever God answers by fire and comes down, sends down fire to consume your sacrifice, we'll know that that is the real God. The prophets of Baal got their bowl ready. They've got their altar made. And they started to call out to Baal. Baal, hear us! Baal! Baal! Send fire! Baal! They started calling and praying out. They jumped around. They danced around. They were screaming. They were doing all kinds of stuff. Now Elijah was over here because he, he knew that Baal was fake and Baal was not going to answer the prayers. So Elijah was over here and he was saying, Why don't you call louder? I don't think Baal can hear you. Hey, maybe Baal's sleeping and you need to wake him up. Elijah was making fun of them because he knew they were wasting their time. They could have been jumping and screaming all day, but Baal was not going to hear them because Baal was a false god. In fact, he said, maybe Baal's on a trip. Maybe he's on vacation somewhere. Maybe you need to just keep screaming. But you know what? They even started doing terrible things. They started cutting themselves because they thought, maybe if, if Baal sees us hurting ourselves or bleeding, he'll know that he needs to answer us. Isn't that terrible? They even did those terrible things, but guess what? Do you think Baal answered them? No, no not at all, because he's fake. In fact, they sort of kept screaming and crying out. They probably had no voices left by the nighttime. They did it all day until the evening. Still, no answer. 
Because a God that's made out of stone, a fake God, an idol, cannot hear and answer prayer. When there was no answer, Elijah called them to him, and he made a sacrifice before the Lord. He was getting it ready. He got the altar. It was a special altar. It wasn't just any altar. God had a certain altar that had to be fixed up and made for the sacrifices to him. They used 12 stones. 12 stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Elijah said, we're going to make this show you this is really God. He said, we're digging, going to dig a trench, like a ditch, around the outside of the altar. We're going to make it deep. He said, I want you to go get four water pots. Now remember, it hadn't rained in three and a half years, but they must have still had a little bit of water. They filled up the four water pots and they dumped it all over. So the water filled up the trench and soaked the wood. There was wood on the altar. There was the animal for the sacrifice, the bowl. And then they poured water all over it. Now what happens to wood? Does wood burn when it's wet? No. no. So he was saying, hmm, I'm going to show you. Go get four water pots. Then he said, hey, go get four more. So they came with another four and they dumped it on the sacrifice. And then he said, go get four more. And there were up to 12. They dumped that on there. Everything was soaked. The water had filled up the ditch that was all around the altar. Elijah said, I want them to see that this is really God, that there's no magic, there's no trickery. It's soaking wet. When the sacrifice was ready, Elijah spoke to the Lord. He said, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you've turned their hearts back again to you. Elijah didn't shout and dance. He didn't scream. He didn't cut himself. He just spoke a simple prayer to the Lord. Immediately, fire came down from heaven whoosh, and consumed the sacrifice. It was gone. It was burnt up. All the water in the trench was gone. Licked right up. It burned up the wood and the stones. The one God, true God, showed his people that he alone is the God and there is no other. When the people saw the amazing power of God, they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. They had seen that Baal could do nothing. But the Lord heard and answered their prayer, Elijah's prayer. Elijah possessed zeal for God. When he was so so excited and so determined, he had passionately pursued God and he was going to show Israel who the true God is. That is zeal. Um, even when it wasn't popular, even when the government was punishing them, even when Jezebel said, you go find all those prophets of God and you kill them all. Elijah said, nope. He said, I'm going to still stand for God and I'm going to still do right. Do you know what? All over the world, there are people that don't love God. It's very sad. And they're trying to keep some people from even worshiping the one true God. There's countries where it's against the law for people to, to have a Bible. It's against the law for them to open the Bible and read the Bible. It's against the law for preachers to stand up and preach the Bible. But people are still obeying God because they know that it's right. And they know it's the truth. And they're, they have zeal for God no matter what anybody says. First, Elijah heard from God. You know, Elijah had to obey God, didn't he? When God said, I want you to go to King Ahab, don't you? what if Elijah said, oh no, Ahab, his wife is Jezebel, and they're going to kill me. No, he said, okay, God, if you want me to go talk to Ahab, I'm going to go talk to Ahab. Um, do you know what? God is trying to speak to us today. You say, you mean like I'm going to hear God say, hello, you don't hear God's voice out loud, but when you open the Bible and you read God's word every day, God can speak to your heart and tell you, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. That's a verse in the Bible. Oh, I should be obeying my mom and dad. Oh. The Bible will tell you that about being a wise man and staying with wise, having wise friends. Oh, that means I should be careful who I hang around at school. There's all these things that God can speak to you through the Bible and tell you how to live and how to have a happy life, and what he wants you to do. Reading your Bible. Um, do you know what else? Through God's word, through prayer. Hey, God wants us to talk to him. God loves it when you talk to him. When you pray and you tell him something, he loves it. God wants you to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Do you know anybody that likes to talk a lot? I know some people that really like to talk a lot. God wants you to do that with him. It's just like if you pulled up a chair and you sat down and you 
had another chair next to you said, here, God, you sit here and talk to me for a while. Let's talk. I want to tell you about everything that happened today. God loves that. Because you know God is really here with you because God is everywhere. God wants you to talk to him. Um, God always hears us. Just talk, talk, talk to God. And God is so happy to hear what you have to say. Also, we need to listen to God's word through the people that he sends in our life, through your teachers, your Christian school teachers, or through um, here at Sunday school, or when Pastor Johnson's preaching. God wants you to be listening because he has something to teach you that he wants you to hear. Um, God used his prophets in the Old Testament, and today he has given us a message to tell people. What's the message that God wants us to tell people? about Jesus, how Jesus died on the cross, how he was buried and rose again to pay for our sins so we can have a home in heaven. And that's the message God wants us to share with other people. He doesn't want us to hide it. He doesn't want us to keep it to ourselves. He wants us to share that message. And the good news is, after all of that happened with, with Elijah, do you know that God sent rain after three and a half years? He did, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And God protected Elijah. Everywhere he went, God protected him. And God promises to protect us too. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can learn about Elijah. Help us to have zeal. Help us, Lord, to not be afraid to do what you want us to do. Help us to obey you. Help us to read our Bibles and pray. Help us to listen when you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are going to sing another song. Let's try... The love of Jesus. Remember that one? I've done it in a while. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. Oh, oh, wonderful love. Ready? It's higher than the mountain. It's deeper than the ocean. It's wider than the universe. Oh, oh, wonderful love. Good singing. Let's try hallelujah. I am free. Jesus came to rescue me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm free. I'm free. He came down from above, wrapped me in his arms of love. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm free. I'm free. Hallelujah. I am free. Jesus came to rescue me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm free. I'm free. He came down from above, wrapped me in his arms of love. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm free, I'm free. Good job, good singing. From the dust of the earth, God created man, his red made man, a living soul. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and that is why. So I was made in his likeness, created in his image. For I was born to serve the Lord, and I can't deny him. I'll always walk beside him. For I was born to serve the Lord. Ready? My hands were made to help my neighbor. My eyes were made to read God's word. My feet were made to walk in his footsteps. My body is the temple of the Lord. I was made in his likeness, created in his image. For I was born to serve the Lord, and I can't deny him, I'll always walk beside him, for I was born to serve the Lord. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes.
lusty song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, Jude,